fact that we have a number of people visiting with us today, and we're so glad that you're here. We're glad to welcome you to visit with us, and we hope that you can come back and be with us frequently. This reading from Acts, the second chapter, verse 38, leads us into uh, a reading from Ephesians, the first chapter, where it talks about our receiving the Holy Spirit. And some people, in, in reading Acts, the second chapter, verse 38 and 39, do not understand at all what that's talking about. How do we receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, verse 38 and 39? And the remarkable thing that I find in Acts, the second chapter, is that number one, the people on the day of Pentecost, and there were over, over 3,000 people there, as far as is recorded, there's not one of them that asked the question after the statement was made, you repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not one of them asked the question, what's that mean? What is this gift of the Holy Spirit that you're promising to us? And therefore, it makes me think that they understood something about what the apostles were talking about. And therefore, I want to read to you some of the passages with which they were probably well aware and knew more about possibly than you and I do. The study of the Holy Spirit is not an easy subject. The Bible does not make it difficult. The traditions of men have made it so. The Bible does not say a lot about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament as much as the Father and the Son. He does say a lot about the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. And those things that he says in the Old Testament, I would direct your attention to before we get into the charts. And I want to thank Brian for making those charts for me. I need all the help I can get. In Psalm 52, this is the passage where David is praying for forgiveness of the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. And he says in chapter 52, I'm 51 and verse 10. Chapter 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. There is in Hebrew a way that they made poetry that we don't use today. They would say a phrase, and then they would repeat the same idea in another phrase that meant the same thing, only in different words. He says in verse 11, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. David was aware of a principle that we're going to become aware of as we read through some of these Old Testament passages. That God's Spirit was with the nation of Israel and with everyone in the nation of Israel so long as they were living according to God's will. And when, we, when they transgress God's will, then God would remove His Spirit from them. He would simply remove His Spirit from them, which meant they were no longer in his presence, that is, his presence was no longer with them. His presence no longer being with them, his spirit was no longer with them, and therefore they were no longer in the gracious relationship with God. When they repented of their sins and uh, they asked God's forgiveness, then God would allow them to have his presence with them once again. His spirit would be with them once again, and that would mean they're in the gracious relationship with God all over again. That's just what it meant. In the book of, uh, in the next passage we're going to be reading in the book of Psalm 136, verse, verse, verse 139, the passage that talks about the presence of God. Where is God? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? And again, a parallelism, which means that the presence of God is the same thing as the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God with them is the same thing as the presence of God with them. Or going further than that, we can turn over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 32. Am I pulling the chart yet? Psalm 51, verses 10 through 13 is the passage we just read. His spirit equals his presence. That's a parallelism. The next passage is Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8. Again, he uses parallelism. He says, beginning with verse 139, verse 7, we just read that. The next one is Isaiah 32, verses 9 through 18. In chapter 32, verse 13, he talks about the land of Israel being overcome by their enemies and because of the sinfulness of the people. He says in verse 13, For the land of my people in which many thorns and briars shall come up, yea, for all the joyful houses and for the jubilant city, because the palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks, how long is that desolate condition going to last? Verse 15, until my spirit is poured out upon us from God, from God's spirit poured out upon us from on high. When God's spirit is poured out upon us from on high, then the wilderness will become a fertile field, and the fertile field is going to be considered as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field, and the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Then, when God's Spirit is poured out, out upon Israel, then my people will live in a peaceful habitation, and in secure dwellings, and in undisturbed resting places, and it shall... That, you see what the difference is? When, God, when they sinned and God's spirit was taken away from them and they were occupied by their enemies, God's presence was no longer with them. His blessings, his grace, gracious blessings would no longer be with them. But when they were restored to the favor of God, it is said God sent his spirit back to, to them once again. His peace was with them. His rest was with them. His presence was with them. Now even though God poured out his spirit upon all of Israel... Not all of Israel received miraculous gifts. Just because God's Spirit, that is His gracious presence, was with them once again, that's a relationship. It does not mean that everyone in the nation received miraculous gifts, does it? The fact is that God's pouring out His Spirit upon Israel was simply restoring them to gracious relationship with Himself. And the next passage that is on our board, I'll try to follow it more Isaiah, the 44th chapter and verse 33. 44 and verse 33. Verses 3, I mean, and following. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my offspring, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. The parallelism means that when God puts his spirit, pours out his spirit, Upon their offspring, he would be pouring out his blessings. His gracious presence would be with them, and that means they would receive blessings from God. Uh, they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of waters, and so on. So that God's presence and his spirit means the same thing. And when God sees his nation in sin and departing from him, then he says, I will depart from you. Some have the mistaken notion, I think Israel had the mistaken notion, that God would never, never abandon them. That uh, they believed that God would never forsake them. That no matter what they would do, God would never take his spirit away from them. Back in Deuteronomy 31, and beginning with verse 6, this is about the time that Moses was about to die. And God is speaking to Moses. Be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble of, at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. That's verse 6. 
Verse 8 says, The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's conditional. How do I know it's conditional? In the same chapter, he says in verse 16, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. And this people will arise and play the harlot with strange gods in the land in the midst of which they're going. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them. If they forsake me, I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Is it not because our God is not among us? He's not with us? His presence is no longer here? That these evils have come upon them? I will surely hide my face in that day because of all of the evils which they do, for they will turn to other gods. In the Second Chronicles, this one is in the chapter... 12, Second Chronicles, the 12th chapter. He says in verses 5 and following, uh, in the middle of verse 5, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, so I have also forsaken you to Shishak. Well, he, he says because they repented, he was not going to completely forsake them. He was, going, he was going to let Shishak take, take them over, but he would not completely forsake them. And then in the book of uh, Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. Listen to this very carefully. Now the, the Spirit of God came on Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will let you find him. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. He's talking about the fellowship of God with his people. And he says if his people seek after him, he will let them find him. If his people forsake him, he will forsake them. He will no longer be with them. They understood that principle, didn't they? In the book of 2 Chronicles, the 23rd, 25, 24th chapter, 24th chapter, verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus God has said, Why do you transgress the commandments of, of the Lord and do not prosper? They didn't prosper when they transgressed God's law. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. The Lord is with Israel in his presence and in his gracious presence, but when they depart from him, he departs from them. When they forsake God, God forsakes them. Turning to the book of uh, Isaiah, chapter 139. I, I've, I've read uh, Psalm, verse, I have read that. I want to go back over to Isaiah, this time to the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. This is a principle that is well known to everybody. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the hand of the Lord is not shortened, that he cannot say, neither is ear heavy, heavy, that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated you from God. He will not hear. So whenever man sins, his sin separates man from God. There is a separation of man from God. When there's a separation of man from God, it is not God that departed. It was man that departed from God. And God said, if you, uh, if you uh, abandon me, I will abandon you. If you turn away from me, I will turn away from you. As long as they're obeying God's commandments, God's spirit would be with them. And they understood that. In chapter 59, verse... Uh, Nine and following, he talks about their worldliness and how that they had, how that they were treated after they departed from God. Justice is far from us. Righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. 
We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midnight as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears. <laughs> well, I've seen brethren growl like great bears. And moan sadly like, like doves. We hope for justice and there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us and our transgressions are with us. We know our iniquities. In the middle of verse 15 it says, Now the Lord saw their condition. He felt for them. He had compassion upon them. It was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. Then in verse, the middle of verse 10, verse 16, then his own arm, his own arm, that's a word that sometimes is a designation for Jesus Christ back in those days, but his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness beheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay. When they obey God, he blesses them. When they disobey God, he departs from them. His blessings are no longer with them. And then in verse 20, a Redeemer will come to Israel, to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant, says the Lord. My spirit is upon them. And my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from, depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring from now, from, from now on forevermore. What he's saying is, whenever they did not obey God as a nation, God took his spirit away from them. He was no longer in fellowship with them. He no longer had a gracious relationship with them. When they repented of their sins and asked God's forgiveness, then God would come back to them and he would, as it were, pour out his spirit upon them. And that's simply a matter of saying God now has gracious relationship with them. His grace is given to them. And that is sometimes accompanied by signs and wonders in some people or by some people so that the whole nation might know that this is going on. Not all in the nation received miraculous gifts, only a selected few. But when they saw those, that was the sign that God's Spirit was being poured out upon the nation, and God's gracious Spirit was with them once again. In Joel, the second chapter, verse 28 and 29, and it shall come to pass after this, and he's talking there in Jeremiah, the first chapter, about a great loc a crowd of locusts. What those locusts are, I believe, is a great army that he talks about in chapter 1. This locust army is going to come in. What the first locust, the, the, the first wave doesn't eat, the second wave will eat. What the second wave does not eat, the third wave will eat. And they will completely demolish Jerusalem and all of the surrounding territory. But then when God's grace was extended to them once again, it is written, Joel, the second chapter, verse 28, 29, it will come to pass after this that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. In other words, this time... Whenever there is a reconciliation of God's, of God's grace upon the people, the people to God, is not just the Israelite nation. It is all mankind. I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind. That does not mean that all of mankind is going to receive miraculous gifts. But there would be a manifestation of miraculous gifts when this started so that people would know that this is what's happening. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all mankind. Who's going to receive it? All mankind is going to receive this outpouring of the grace of God or this outpouring of God's Spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men will see, uh, see uh, visions. And even on your male and female servants, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days. There's going to be a new relationship with all mankind. And of course, this was the prophecy that is quoted in Acts, the second chapter by the Apostle Peter in his first gospel sermon in Acts the 16th chapter. Now these visions, these, these great works, these marvelous deeds that were being done caused uh, the people in Jerusalem to say, what's going on here? Peter said, this is what was foretold by Joel in his prophecy in Joel the second chapter. It shall come to pass in the last days, he says in Acts the second chapter. 
And these things that are happening in Acts 2 are things that they, they recognize that God had had upon many occasions removed his spirit from Israel when they sinned and then poured out his spirit upon them whenever they were reconciled to God. So what he's saying here is God is now going to pour forth his spirit upon all mankind, not just the Israelite nation. And so whenever the people were convicted of their sins in Acts the second chapter and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted of crucifying the Son of God. What shall we do, they asked. They're not asking, what shall we do to make a payment on our car? What shall we do, they asked. They were not asking, what shall we do to get our children well who are sick? They were asking, being convicted of sins, they said, what shall we do? You're convicted of crucifying the very Son of God. And they said, what shall we do? They were, what shall we do, they asked. What were they, what were they asking for? What shall we do for what? Peter said, you repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To whom is that promise? Just to the Jews or who? For this promise is not only to you, it's a promise to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. All of those who are called by the gospel shall receive this gift, this promise, and it's called by Peter in Acts the second chapter, verse 38, 39, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, God is offering his gift of the Holy Spirit to all of those who are the called. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 12, Paul is writing primarily to a, 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 a Gentile group, a Gentile church. And in this he says in verse 12, addressing the Gentiles who were in that church, he says, at one time you were without God. You were without God. God was not with you. But now you are the temple of God, he says in chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. At the conclusion of that chapter, he says, Now you are the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit of God dwelleth in you. What makes them the temple of God? Because the Spirit dwells in them. What does that mean? It means they did not have God at one time, but now they do have God, and God has a relationship with them, and that relationship is described as, you are now the temple of God, and God's Spirit dwells in you. That makes you holy. That makes you set apart. This is the beginning of sanctification. The sanctification continues. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth, Jesus said in John 17, 17. But this is the beginning of sanctification, the beginning of their being made holy, and that's the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, and they are the temple of God. Their worship is acceptable because they're, they're the temple of God. Their prayers will be heard because they are the temple of God. They can offer sacrifices of praise to God continually, the fruit of their lips, because they are the temple of God. And they're the temple of God because... They've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which dwells in them. And dwelling in them is a scriptural term. The Holy Spirit dwelling in them is a scriptural term. It's not a, an unscriptural term. That's a scriptural term. Holy Spirit dwelling in them. In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 19, the Apostle Paul is talking to individual Christians in that passage, saying why they should not commit fornication. He's saying because... We are the temple of the living God. That is, individual Christians are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What, is it, what, what is, good does it do us to have the Holy Spirit dwelling with us? Or dwelling in us? What does it do for us? Well, it establishes a new relationship. It says, you now can pray and God will listen to your prayers. You can now offer worship to God and he will accept your worship. You can now accept the fact that God is uh, with you as they, he, he is with no other people in the world. I am your God and you are my people because God's spirit dwells in us. And by the way, again, he uses the term dwelling in you. Your, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, who is in you, whom you have from God. 
In 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 16, the Paul is talking to the a church again. He says, for we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 9, Paul is addressing the church in Rome. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, and in the flesh is used in a, is a figurative sense. You are not in the flesh, that is, following after flesh and lusts and desires and living in that, in that kind of life. You're not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. If so be, just as God has said, if, in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells among you. If He dwells in you, then you're in the Spirit, not in the flesh. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, and interchangeably, when he's using the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit, he's using those terms interchangeably in, in Romans. He says, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Him. You don't belong to Him. You don't belong to Him if His Spirit does not dwell in you. Now that dwelling in you, I tried to explain by looking at those Old Testament passages. Is simply saying, when we are in sin, God's Spirit is not with us. When we have the forgiveness of sins, then God's Spirit is with us. He, he is with us. The Son is with us. And the, and, and the Holy Spirit and the Father is with us. All three are with us in fellowship. It does not bestow miraculous gifts in us simply because we have a new relationship with God. He's simply saying, now you're a child of God because you're a child of God. God is your father. What good does that do us? How do I feel because of that? Well, if you learn it and you believe it, you ought to have joy. It doesn't cause you to have any sensual feeling. It doesn't cause you to smell anything or, or taste anything or touch anything. It doesn't cause you to have some, some emotional experience where you're falling on the floor. It simply says, now you have a new relationship. And this new relationship is established because you've obtained the forgiveness of sins that separated you from God. When you are no longer separated from God by sin, then God's Spirit is with you. He is with you. The Son is with you. In John, the 14th chapter, about verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and will dwell with him. The Father and the Son will dwell in those who love Him and keep His commandments. Does that mean they have obtained miraculous gifts? No. He's saying a relationship is established. A relationship. And that new relationship is established as uh, defined in this Ephesians, the first chapter. I don't have it here. Well, I'm going to have to quit. My time is up. Do you want to know some more? Okay, he says in this passage in Ephesians, the first chapter, that it's called a seal of the Holy Spirit. Now, a seal of the Holy Spirit is simply saying God put his brand upon us. He put his brand of ownership upon us. Why is that important? It's not important for the world because the world does not know us. It's important only to us to know that God knows us. He's put His brand of ownership upon us. He owns us. He's put His seal upon us. Putting His seal upon us also means that we are special. In the book of Revelation, it is repeated several times over, and I'm going to try to read all of these, but uh, in the book of Revelation, it's repeated four times that certain ones upon the earth, in fact, everybody on the earth in this area was going to be destroyed, except those upon whom God had put His seal on their forehead. And you read those four verses that talk about God putting his seal upon them. And then when the destruction is coming, he says, you destroy everyone, or oh, the wind and so on, will destroy everyone except those upon whom the seal is on their forehead. You read in one verse, the seal is the name of, Patrick, what is that? It's the name of Jehovah. It's the name of the Lord. And when the Lord owns you, he will put his stamp of ownership upon you. And Paul talked to Timothy saying, the Lord knows those who are his. Is that for the world to know? No. It's for you and me to know. 
When we read that, there is assurance and confidence that comes to us because God has put his stamp up or seal upon us. And then he says that indwelling of the Holy Spirit or this seal is also something else. It's a pledge. It's a down payment. And what is that pledge or down payment? Uh, it says, is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1, 14. What that means is when you buy a piece of property, put a down payment. That's a pledge that you're going to buy the property, right? When God saves us in being baptized into Christ, he calls us, we answer the call of God, we're baptized. He then gives us the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is given as a down payment, a pledge that he wants us to live with him. He's saying, in essence, I'm going to be with you throughout the rest of your life. My spirit, my presence, my gracious presence will be with you for the rest of your life. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit will be with you and his presence will be with you the rest of, his, rest of your life here on earth. I'm doing that so that you will know how precious you are to me so that I want you to go home and be with me forever and ever. My spirit will be with you as a down payment, as a promise that I want you to live with me because I'll come and live with you for a little while. An inheritance we're looking forward to. A pledge of our inheritance. May I say again, every time that Israel departed from the Lord and the Lord removed his spirit from them and then they repented and God poured out his spirit upon them, it does not mean that everybody in the nation received miraculous gifts. They didn't. Even though God poured out his spirit upon the whole nation, upon all of them, not all of them received miraculous gifts. The primary idea of the pouring out of his spirit, as in Acts the second chapter, is that he's extending his gracious presence. He's, he's extending his gracious, what he has for mankind. All of his grace and mercy and compassion and peace and rest and so on. All that he has for mankind is being extended to them. And if they will receive it, then God will dwell with them. And the Spirit will dwell with them. And the Christ will dwell with them. And numerous times it talks about his dwelling in us and we dwell in him. We dwell in Christ and Christ dwells in us. We dwell in the Spirit and the Spirit dwells in us. And it's simply talking about a relationship. i got to quit. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. Resolve no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that